All right, welcome to the third day of the Grad School Success Summit. We are on the first session, which is all about imposter syndrome. And I'm really excited because Viveta has an awesome, awesome talk with us to help us think about how we are, our, our mindset as it relates to being graduate students, how we feel prepared and capable of getting through this journey. And so if you are not following the amazing Instagram page, Diversity in Academia, Viveta is the beauty and the brains behind it. And we've been friends on Instagram for quite a while now. So I'm really grateful that she agreed to share her expertise with us today. And without further ado, I'm going to take it um, right over to you, Vivetha. Thank you for coming. Hi, everyone. My name is Vivetha Thambinathan. I'm a second year PhD student in um, at a university in Canada. And I'm just going to share my screen so we can get started. OK, so the talk today that I'm going to be, um, this talk today is more of an informal chat. And it's titled Becoming More Than Enough, How to Overcome Imposter Syndrome in Grad School. So I just want to start with positioning myself. And this is just me exposing myself as a qualitative researcher, and that's OK. Um, I'm a Tamil Canadian activist engaged in community spaces. I'm a visible minority settler and a Canadian citizen. I'm a first gen PhD student. Um, as you already know, diversity in academia is one of my accounts. And I'm highly committed to refugee studies and health equity. And a kind of an odd fact is I've always been the youngest in my class. And that might seem cute in elementary school, but it's kind of not when you're in grad school, especially when you're in your PhD, because you might get kind of side-eyed when you're giving a conference talk or, uh, you know, just get judged a little bit. But I'll be talking about all of this. So to me, all of this, these lived experiences, my engagement with the community, my way of knowing and seeing the world shapes how I think, how I experience, and ultimately how I research as a PhD student. And transformative critical theory paradigm, yes, I'm going to bring a little bit of methods into this, but not too much. It just means that what's real in this world is the world of mechanisms that produces the world of experiences. That is what it is for me. And I believe that reality is shaped by the history of social, political, cultural, economic, ethnic, and gender forces that have influenced the world over time. And I'm just saying this because it's going to be very clear in my presentation that I feel this way, but I'm just going to put this out there. Now. Becoming More Than Enough, um, I'm sure some of you have guessed, but there are titles from uh, books of two strong Black women, Michelle Obama and Elaine Welteroff. And I titled this uh, um, Becoming More Than Enough about your syndrome in different ways throughout their book, through storytelling, and just through um, talking about their lives. Now, if you've ever felt like you don't belong, like your friends and colleagues are gonna discover that you're a fraud and that you don't actually deserve your jobs and accomplishments, well then you know what imposter syndrome feels like. Imposter syndrome is a psychological pattern in which, in which one doubts their accomplishments and they have this internalized fear of being exposed as a fraud. And though there is external evidence that proves otherwise, we remain convinced that we're frauds and that we don't deserve all that's been achieved. And in this comic right here, um, there's the student who's getting an email from their prof about getting involved in a project, they have this imposter syndrome attack, and then they reply, yes, I'll be happy to be involved. So in my opinion, this is actually a good um, outcome because this is an imposter moment and you're not letting these feelings actually affect your consequences and your actions. And this feeling is completely normal. Um, Denzel Washington felt that way, if that makes you feel any better. And high schoolers feel this way, everyone does. Now, Dr. Valerie Young um, is a claimed imposter syndrome expert. If you Google imposter syndrome, everything is going to be about Dr. Valerie Young. Her talks are all gonna come up. She has 10 steps to combat imposter syndrome. However, I do wanna say that this is written by, uh, this is by a white woman, and that's important because it's clear from the knowledge that she produces that she's a white woman. And what I mean by this is that women of color have different experiences and there are there is a nuanced difference um, of imposter syndrome being experienced by women of color and by um, the rest of the community. So why is imposter syndrome different for women of color? 
Well, it's multidimensional. Our self-doubt is linked to our racial and our gender identity. Most of us have experienced years of gendered racism leading to feelings of insecurity in our minds. As a result, we kind of feel this constant pressure to defend our worthiness to others and to ourselves. There's also this lack of representation. So the notion of if you can't see it, you can't be it. However, after listening to the talk yesterday from uh, future doctors, future PhDs, um, STEM media and Black Scientists Matter, I do want to reframe this because though we don't directly see representation around us, there is representation. We know women of color, we know Black PhDs. So it's just about uh, the representation not being directly around us. Next, there's stereotype threat um, and internalized false messages of inferiority. So all of this um, could be, it could be a guidance counselor who told you you couldn't do something when you were growing up, or just the negative and false stereotypes that media um, re, uh, you know, reproduces. So all of this are additional factors of why. And imposter syndrome might be triggered by feeling othered in predominantly white or exclusive spaces, navigating gendered racial microaggressions in class, or just merely existing in this culture that either ignores us or objectifies us. Um, and here is this lovely page from Elaine Walteroth's book where it says, sometimes just being yourself is the radical act. When you occupy space and systems that weren't built for you, your authenticity is your activism. And I do strongly believe that within academia, our existence itself is political. And with this all being said, just a note, we can't just lump all women of color in the same boat because it would be unjust to do so. We know that black women's experiences have been historically different and are presently different. So the way we discuss and understand imposter syndrome has to account for these different social realities. Um, and I love it when Michelle Obama talks about it in her book and her documentary that she's been on all the powerful tables in the world, yet not all of them are actually smart. So just remembering this is important as well. Okay, so this is, um, oops, okay, so this is part of a reflection that I wrote back in my first year, so that would be last year, um, titled, My PhD Won't Change the World and That's Okay. This was actually for an assignment, and I'm just going to read some of this. My PhD won't change the world and that's okay. I muttered these disappointing words a few months into this program with feelings of inadequacy and anxiety. Despite my initial optimistic outlook, after taking methods courses, the perfect dissertation that lived in my mind transformed into an endless marathon with methodological hurdles and unanticipated philosophical roadblocks. In this intimate dialogue, I'll reflect on key tensions, recount my raw emotions, and expose my unripe ideas as a naive researcher. Well, it's safe to say I'm pretty dramatic. But also, what I wanted to mention is that this reflection that I had from last year, I kind of forgot about it until I was prepping for this talk. And when I look back on it, I realized there were things that I'm still unsure about and have no knowledge about. But there's also other things that I now know confidently and I have knowledge of and I know that I don't feel the same way. So I suggest that everyone um, kind of does this reflection for each year of grad school, um, whether it's for a PhD or a master's or maybe every couple of months and reflect back on it. And this will be um, good as you evolve through grad school. Okay, so this is really what we're all here for. So these are the three things that I kind of will talk about um, for overcoming imposter syndrome. Number one, reframe your thinking. Number two, find your people. And number three, own your journey. So reframe your thinking. So Dr. Valerie Young was the aforementioned woman that I was talking about who's the expert in imposter syndrome. She says the only way to stop feeling like an imposter is to stop thinking like one. And I'm just gonna do a little bit of a critique here and say, you know what, this makes it seem like it's just all in your head. And I don't agree, especially for women of color. It's not all in our head. It's because of external factors, because of the things we've went through. So I just wanna um, reframe how we think about that. and especially because we don't live in a post-racial society, there's a very real possibility that people are thinking maybe negative thoughts of me. Other people may not think I'm smart enough or good enough. That sounds like an entire buzzkill, but I'm just saying this because never, who cares about what they think? Their thoughts of you, whether it's real or imagined, they don't affect your view, the view of yourself. And if people think negatively of you, they're wrong. So give yourself permission to disregard their faulty opinion. Um, and I'm just going to debunk some mental myths here. 
So as a woman of color, I need to prove my worth to my non-person of color. So the truth is you don't need anyone's approval to claim your well-deserved and earned spot in grad school. So remember this, you got the acceptance just like everyone else and you don't need to prove why you, you, you were here. The next one is my contributions are less valuable than those of my non-person of color peers. The truth is your race, gender, upbringing, background does not diminish your value. Your success has not occurred despite your race or gender. Your identity strengthens the value of your contributions and it actually inspires the next generation. And the myth of I don't belong. You're here because you belong. So you don't need to be sexual, you need to be you, and you're more than enough. Um, as women of color, I feel that um, we tend to have these myths in our heads sometimes, and we have to resist this feeling and treat mental myths just the way you would treat other claims. Analyze them, use evidence, and the truth is we're all here for a reason, and we're more than enough. So, um, going on the same topic of reframing our thinking, it's important to separate feelings from fact. Um, this is something that Dr. Valerie Young talks about as well. And how I'm going to frame this is separate your initial emotional reactions to something from your truth and your fact. So first up, you're going to have to develop a new mental script. And what I mean by this is you're going to have to replace mental myths with truths, just as we just did. And then when an event occurs that makes you feel differently, record your thoughts. And you can either do this by journaling or by voice recording using the app on your phone. I do this because I love talking and I'll do an internal monologue anytime. And then revisit and reflect later in time. And you ask yourself, do you still feel the same way about the event and what has changed since then? So this could be days later, weeks later, months later. And you know what, I wasn't actually gonna talk about this, but in the spirit of keeping it real, I will. So recently something has happened, um, something like this has happened for me. I actually had an event, um, sorry, I wasn't even prepared to talk about this, but here we go. So there, so I applied for this scholarship last year and I heard about it recently, I heard back from it recently. The truth was, um, I knew it was quite competitive uh, my supervisors let me know that whatever happens happens. So, you know, when they let you know, you know, it's extra competitive. Um, it was the first scholarship I ever applied to in my PhD program. So I've never had any background in scholarship writing. I haven't had time to refine those skills. And ultimately the probability, ultimately the probability, sorry, one second. Sorry. So ultimately, the probability of me not receiving the scholarship was greater than me actually receiving it. I knew all this, but once I heard back, all of it just kind of flew out the, all of it just kind of flew out the door, all the truths. And what I mean by this is when I got the email that told me that I was waitlisted and waitlisted and not rejected, that was not a distinction I was ready to make at that time because to me, it didn't matter. I didn't get accepted. And, uh, you know, I pulled up my phone, did the whole internal monologue, and I was like, why didn't I get this? I should have, like, what does it mean for me? Do I, should I even be a PhD student? Am I good enough to be here? Does my research even matter? I was asking all the questions. Um, and, you know, I'm a dramatic and stubborn, so, you know, great fit. So later in time, when I went back to it, a few days later, I revisited this, and I heard myself, and I was thinking, wait, this girl's so arrogant. This girl is narcissistic, egotistical. I can say that, you can't. But I was just asking myself, why did I think that like I should have gotten it? And then when I unpacked that, I realized that I put so much value to this scholarship, this external factor, I associate it with um, reassurance and validation that I should be here. I was seeing the scholarship as uh, some sort of confirmation that I should be here as a PhD student, I should exist in academia, and I should do this research. And you should never put that externally um, on any factor because it's not guaranteed. That should be something that comes from within. So after unpacking all of that, I realized where my initial emotional reactions were coming from. And, you know, now I realize where those feelings of imposter syndrome were really coming from. And, and I also, I wasn't going to say this, but so my partner is someone who lives their life very purposefully and intentionally, and they um, appreciate everything in life. 
And they're one of those people where everything is just a lesson waiting to be learned. Every challenge is just a teachable moment. And I used to think that was very, um, you know, I can say this naive and just kind of corny. But when I, I actually adopted that mindset to think about my scholarship. And then I realized, wait, that's not naive. That's kind of not fourth grader attitude. That's actually the attitude you need to make yourself resilient, to make yourself be able to attack any problem that comes your way and really to um, stand your ground in academia. So, um, you know, I wasn't gonna say that, but they're not here and they don't know I'm saying nice things about them. So, okay, so moving on. Second is find your people. So this is actually a text from my, um, I call him my go-to person, my everything in academia, shout out to Gudgeon. And the backstory for this was, it was last, last summer, um, exactly this time and it was my first year and I got invited to do a conference talk and then be a part of this panel on decolonizing academia and I you know I was feeling really good about it until I did a mistake of googling the other panelists that were with me I googled them and I realized oh wait they're whole ass professors they have books they have chapters they have all these publications and you know of course all the feelings of imposter syndrome got to me so I did what I would do and I kind of freaked out a little texted um, my person and they replied they may have all those publications but you have your own story your own lived experience and your voice is just as if not way more important than theirs imposter syndrome is real, especially being a woman of color, but you have so much to contribute, you're gonna be amazing. And I'm just showing this as an example because it is so meaningful to have supportive friends and just to have that strong support system around you because it will help you when you doubt yourself. And I'm not gonna say that I felt completely amazing right when I got this text, but it did make me kind of reevaluate how I was thinking. And I also love this quote that's behind every sex successful woman, there's a group text hyping her up. So I'm not the type of person who um, reaches out every time I have an issue in my life, but I do think, what would they say? So when you ask that to yourself, you, you know your friends better than anyone. So you already know what they're gonna say to you. Alternatively, you could also um, assume that your best friend has this problem and they're coming to you. And then ask yourself, what would you say? Because God knows we are way kinder to our best friends than we are to ourselves. Not sure why, but if we extend this kindness, we can get back to the right mindset. Um, and then celebrate every tiny victory. I am so sad to say that we have a lot more L's in grad school than we have wins. But if you celebrate every win, um, even do um, those you know, writing little notes, putting in a mason jar, and then looking back at it. I always wanted to do that. I never really got to it. But just any sort of way that celebrates every tiny victory so that at the end of this entire long marathon, you will, you, you make sure that it's not just the finish line, it's also the progress, that you make, your, that you make sure you're sustained throughout the journey. And then, oh, Okay, I don't know what happened, but, um, and then also there's online communities. So um, there, when I found Black in Grad School, especially the podcast, I felt heard because uh, listening to it, just like a fly on the wall, listening to those conversations really resonated with me. Also there's PhD ballads and academiology, all these online communities I'd recommend. And also just DMing people if, if they're, you know, if that's allowed in their bio, but DMing people who are also academics and just reaching out to people, having these rant sessions, having writing support groups that are actually also double as a safe space and engaging in communities. Cause I know sometimes it's hard to find that community in on campus. Um, but having that digitally is also something that's really fulfilling and some hashtags um, PhD chat and academic chatter are big ones that to find community on Twitter. But um, yeah, and then the third thing is own your journey. So first off, remember your why. So not because I want a job and I want some money because we all want that. But why are you doing this research in the long run? Do you want to be a professor and mentor people? What is the bigger vision? What is the longer journey out of all of this? And asking yourself that um, that is what's going to motivate you and kind of be your fuel to run this long marathon. And I keep saying long marathon because I'm referring to PhDs, but whatever it is that you're on track for in your program. 
And the only person you should compare yourself to is you. We've heard this and it's easier said than done, but I do feel that in grad school, it's, it's harder to compare because you're not doing the same project. You don't, you don't have the same research interests. There's really no need to compare because it's not like undergrad you get with just versus coursework is going to be done in a year or two. So it's not the same. Um, and if you could look at where you are today versus where you were six months or a year ago and you can see progress, that's all that matters. Um, and that really is all that matters because you see yourself evolving as a person as well. So degree does not equal success. What does success mean to you? So this might sound contradicting in a way because I'm about to say that if you have to drop out of your degree, if you have to go from a PhD to a master's, if you can't get a job outside of academia and you look elsewhere, you know what, that's all success to me and it's the same because you define your success. And um, I'm very committed to also engaging in non-Western ways of thinking. And let's be real, academia is founded on a white colonialist, you know, white colonialist principles and Western values. So I think sometimes we forget that our priorities might not be the same as someone else's. So you gotta really ask yourself whether it, it really is the worst case scenario for you to go from a PhD to a master's. I know so many people have done it. You can look online and there's so many stories out there of someone switching from one program to the next. So just making sure that you don't tie all your happiness to this one title, because let's be honest, titles and degrees aren't going to bring you happiness that is going to have to be internal and coming from other sources in life. Um, embrace all the changes that come with grad school. What I mean by this is you're not only just increasing subject specific knowledge. That's not only thing that's happening. You're gaining interpersonal skills. Like I'm giving this talk. Um, you're um, evolving as a person, you're building character, you're, you're still living life outside of grad school and you're still getting older um, as grad school goes. What I mean by this is you learn so many skills and there's so many things that are transferable outside of, so, outside of grad school that you should, you should think about how that can incorporate in other ways as well. So just looking at the bigger picture, um, if you're going to go outside of academia, um, what other skills can you bring to the table? So everything is important to me. And this sounds corny. A lot of this process is about falling in love with yourself. So there was an indigenous scholar who had a talk recently named Linda Smith, and she said this in a lecture. We need to learn how to love who we are and how to love who we were. Because one of the impacts of colonization is you hate who you become and you don't like yourselves. A lot of this process is about falling in love. And I do think it applies to academia and grad school as well. Because at the end of the day, you are your biggest advocate. And if you think you're more than enough, then the reality is you're already in the right mindset to fight against it all. Um, and, and also, just to end this, I just want to say that you can have an imposter moment. And that's something that Joshua Valerie Young says as well. As in, you can't let those feelings affect you negatively through your actions and have real consequences. Okay, so this is going to be Alante's favorite part. I can say this because she likes affirmations, and I know that through her podcast. But this is something that Elaine Weltra <laughs> posted on her Instagram. Um, I blank am claiming space for blank, no matter what blank may say. So I filled it out, and after kind of sharing what I filled out, I was hoping that maybe we could take like five minutes, whatever Alante wants to do, and then we could share, whether it's, um, you know, through audio or chat. So I wrote, I, Vivetha, am claiming space for scholar activism to unapologetically exist, no matter what mainstream academia may say. And mine is, you know, um, I'm a qualitative researcher, um, so mine, mine makes sense for me. <laughs> but also you can, you can think about it um, in terms of grad school or whatever you want to do. And yeah, take maybe like a few minutes. I love that. Yeah, let's take um, five minutes. If that, I think that's enough for people to kind of think this through. And then um, I'll keep time and we can maybe do a couple of if you want to, if you know you want to share, raise your hand now and then I'll unmute you. How's that sound?
Wow, I'm reading these and it's so healing. <laughs> I know, but we've got a lot of good ones already. Um, so if you want, um, Viveta, you can read them, I can read them, let me know what you prefer. You can read them because okay. you're good at this. <laughs> Cool, cool, cool. All right. I, Lenine, am claiming space for growth and self-acceptance no matter what I may say to myself. Beautiful. I, Shannon, claim self-acceptance, growth, and grace no matter what self-doubt comes into my mind and space. I, Melody, am claiming space for advocating to change the experiences of Black educators and students no matter what the data may say. I, Fabiola, am claiming space for POC no matter the demographic statistics, no matter what the demographic or statistics in my field may say. I, Julia, am claiming space for the end of Black mental health stigma no matter what anyone may say. I, Shar, am claiming space for being authentically myself no matter what anyone may say. I, Norwood, am claiming space for me to become the person I know I can be, regardless of the doubt. I am Ariana, and I am claiming space to become program director for student supportive services that support systems impacted students in higher ed, no matter what admins with 10 years experience plus may say. Yes. I, Lisa, am claiming space for fighting global anti-Blackness as a future organizational psychologist, no matter what my folks may say. Oh my gosh, you're so good, y'all. I, Sarah, am claiming space for all women scientists to stand up and project their badassness. Oh my gosh, these are so beautiful, y'all. Okay, okay. Um, I'm gonna read like four more. Um, I, Morgan, am claiming space for inclusive tech design no matter what Silicon Valley may say. I, Octavia, am claiming space for spreading positivity and uplifting while providing resources in the Black community, no matter what the elitists may say. I, Ayondela, am claiming space for student agency, no matter what power may demand. Oh, these are beautiful, y'all. Oh my gosh. Everyone keep reading the chat. These are so dope. Oh, great job, Avesa. This is beautiful. Um, and I'm done. So I guess we could do questions. I think I'll just put this up here for a few minutes if you want to get in touch with me, but. Yes. Um, these are so beautiful. Oh my goodness. Um, I saw like, honestly, Viveta, I only saw like one question, but I think it was good. Can you all hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah. No, okay. Sorry. <laughs> No way. Um, so um, someone asks, I tend to catch myself after my imposter syndrome freak out. How do you realize it in the moment, right? How do you kind of catch that, that negative self-talk loop when you're in it? For, I'm just going to be honest. I haven't, I haven't really gotten there yet. For me, it's, I, it's because I'm very dramatic. I have my initial reactions. And I think I just, whenever, if it's associated with an event, mm -hmm. um, an external factor, for example, that um, scholarship situation, when I open the email, I already know like the next hour is gonna be something that's out of my control kind of thing. For me, that is. So what I mean by that is those feelings I'm feeling, I'll have to unpack that later. But for me coping with it, I have to let myself feel all the feelings. And that's why I say like journal, Mm -hmm. And when you journal and you're writing down your thoughts, you're going to catch yourself writing down like, wow, why didn't I get this scholarship? Do I even deserve to be here? And maybe you might not realize that at the time, but even an hour later when you're reading that, you're, you're going to catch yourself because you're going to realize, okay, that's not something I would say if my best friend had the same situation. Mm -hmm. So journaling and looking back at it or thinking of the same situation as your friend coming to you and telling you that this happened to them and how would you react? That's all I can say about that. I love it. Um, one thing that I would I would just suggest, you know, um, if I may, y'all, I know, like, I'm trying to, like, <laughs> stay in the background. But one thing is um, a book I, my, my best friend gave me called The Power of Now. And the whole idea is, like, taking, being able to look at your circumstances or how you're acting outside of yourself, kind of, like, 
okay, oh, if I, like, just like how Viveta was saying, if, you're, if you were looking at your best friend or someone else responding that way, what would you notice and say to calm them down? And so sometimes just taking that moment and taking a step outside of myself, I can be like, whoa, you know, I'm behaving or responding in a way that I don't yeah. um, think is fruitful for this situation. And that's a good way to kind of stop that loop. I'm trying to just make sure. Oh, what is the best way? Oh, I love this. What is the best way to support friends and peers dealing with imposter syndrome when you catch them going through it? So if you are someone who's watching a friend deal with that, what do you say to hype them up? Um, well, I think, well, at least for me, because I have friends with a whole different types of personalities, I think kind of catering it depending on how, what kind of person they are. So um, when I was talking about the whole situation with me, um you know getting that scholarship decision and then me i actually talked to my partner about it and they reacted in a sort of but you know you you now know for next year and um you know it's just one failure it's not it's not really like it's not the end of the world though that kind of thinking might help for other people in terms of the positive optimistic talk but for me that wasn't something that worked so I think you have to cater it to different type of people but really it comes down to reminding them that they're more than enough it's telling them reminding them of accomplishments they may have forgotten but you don't right you know whether it's um you ran at 10 or um you published that paper last year like remember to kind of put that into context when they're talking about it i think that really helps or even um saying okay how can we do better like what do you want what's your next goal and focusing on that as well so that's kind of like a channel to um for them to focus all their energy in I think that's that's spot on um keeping track of your friends wins and just having like a little mental mm -hmm. list when they need it uh patrice asks how do you deal with processing how do you deal with a process experiences that remind you that a phd isn't for people like you this happens sometimes to me when programs expect you to foot the cost for things up front or engage in behaviors that are odd with your cultural norms or upbringing like an example might be shaking mm -hmm. hands that is a hard one and something I'm still dealing with as well. Um, so I go to a university that's predominantly white um, and I have been there. I think this is weird for people in the States, but I've been there for my undergrad and my master's <laughs> and maybe that's frowned upon <laughs> in some places. But so I, I know the culture very well, but it's, you know, it's, it's not really the same culture. But what I, um, what I, what has really helped me and Alante was actually asking me this before we even started. Um, this session was why did you start diversity academia? That's one of the um, that's one of the main reasons why I did because I didn't see people like me. And when I started this community, um, a lot of people from the states and a few Canadians as well, I got to interact with them, engage with them, and actually talk to them about experiences and seeing that common um, experience and asking each other, what would you do in this case? What wouldn't you do? So for me. Um, you know, sometimes I drink, sometimes I don't, um, but usually I don't. So when there is a situation where I don't want to be surrounded in a culture of um, alcohol or whatever it is, and, and I feel like a lot of conferences have this mix and mingle and this notion that, you know, a lot of conferences have this like networking, but it's always set at a bar or it's always set like around drinks. And that's not something I'm totally comfortable with. So for me, I've always felt like, I'm not really answering this question. I'm just sharing my experience, but I've always felt like kind of an outsider. So if I don't go, it, it's a whole thing. Um, if I don't go, it's like, why aren't you going? But if I, but if I do go, I myself will feel uncomfortable. So for me, I'll, I'll find other ways to do this. I'll get their business card during the conference, um, email them later, asking them to meet up for lunch the next day. So just, trying to navigate this in ways that I can and also talking to people who share common experiences like me and asking them what do they do about it so I think for reminding you that the PhD program isn't for you I think you really that kind of has to start in your head just reframing that because that's not true we've seen it we've seen it with um, so many Instagram accounts especially um, you know black scientists matter and stem media you see posts every single day so just 
starting with that mindset, I think that's going to help. I like that. Um, setting up your social media with what you want to see. Um, mm -hmm. also is yeah. definitely helpful. Um, how do you combat direct criticism or failure on papers, presentations, tests, and stop feeling like an imposter when you're not doing well in an area that you're passionate about? Reviewer too, anyway. <laughs> um, okay, so how do you combat criticism or failure? Well, I always, I kind of perceive all crit criticism as, you know, constructive. I see that like that initially, you know, when I'm first looking at it. And I also don't take it personally at all. I see it for what it's worth. Oh, it's about my writing. So it just limiting it to that's the writing or that's about my public speaking. That's not about me, if that makes sense. So kind of just having that, um, you know, keeping that at arm's length and making sure and realizing that they're not talking about you as a person. Um, I think that's what helps me. Um, in an area you're passionate about, uh, to me, if you ask me, passion is like what you need to get through everything. And if you're passionate about it, then you're gonna find ways to learn more, um, get mentored about it. So to, if you ask me, I feel like it's, it's actually problematic if you're not passionate about it and you're just simply good at it. That's where a lot of problems occur. So I think just um, realizing that failure, just fa seeing failure as just one loss in the grand scheme of things. Yeah. And I think you even said this earlier, right? We Grad school, unfortunately, sometimes it's more, more L's than W's and sitting with that. Uh, Shannon asks, how do you combat feelings as if you haven't done enough, but others around you tell you how many great things you are doing? Okay, because initially when I read it, I thought it said um, others around you are telling me how many great things they're doing. And I'm like, well, don't listen to them. <laughs> um, that's basically, I feel like my whole talk and I feel like it just does come down to, you know, developing your own mental script and having those, uh, that support system with your friends and also owning your journey. So when you're feeling like you haven't done enough, I think I would just, you know, um, conceptualize that. What do you mean? Break it down. So, because not feeling enough, that's gonna, that, that's very abstract as a concept. And if you are saying, okay, I don't feel enough because I haven't published a paper. Okay. How can I publish the paper within this timeline? If I feel like having concrete goals are going to really help you, um, set yourself up for success and visualize your progress. If you're just having this, um, board in your room about the different aspects of life that you're feeling not so good about and how you're trying to change it. I think that's really going to help. Not saying everything on the board is going to be done, but it's nice to see it there. Yes, I'm seeing a lot of thank yous and people feeling the same way. Ariana feels the same way about like networking events. Yeah. Um, I think, we, of course, you are more than welcome to drop more questions in here. We have time. Like, we, we have time. Yeah, yeah. I talk fast, so. <laughs> so. Perfect. I love, loved the exercise. I can go back and actually finish reading everyone's because I thought they were amazing. I actually did not want to stop reading them. So there are a couple more in here. Um, so I'm going to read these and as more questions come in. I, and Anais, am claiming space for advocating for my students and families, regardless of what administration may say. I hope am claiming space for earning a PhD no matter what my family says. I, call her, I, sorry, Carla. I, Carla, am claiming a space for myself to become whatever I please, no matter what my haters may say. I, Danielle, am claiming space for Black women to reproduce and give birth successfully despite the systemic inadequacies put in place to prevent this. I, Kelly, am claiming space for underrepresented students in STEM, no matter what those are who are colorblind may say. I, Heather Page, am claiming space for holistic growth and healing no matter what my doubters may say. Those are so beautiful. I, Kiana, am claiming space to continually support non-traditional women, students of color, no matter what my white counterparts may say, and to continue to support, the finan support them financially when they need it to reach their goals. I, Crystal, am claiming space for the study of race and activism despite what the mainstream interests of my would prefer. 
I think I got them all. Thank you all so much for sharing your beautiful affirmations. And also, if you have any tips, feel free to put that in the chat because there, there isn't one experience here. That's so true. That's so true. Um, another question popped in. How do you deal with claim? Oh, how do you deal with seeing white fellow colleagues working half as hard and getting rewarded over you? Well, isn't that life? Um, <laughs> but also, um, also realizing there's a difference between me as brown women and black women. Um, but also, I think with that, it's it's just realizing that's out of your control. Um, and I think it comes down to self-advocacy, um, community advocacy, whatever it is that you do um, outside of academia. But within academia, I would say it really comes down to self-advocacy and um, doing your best and you know getting your stuff done because academia is still you know rooted in Western colonial principles and there are there's a lot of things that still need to change and you don't have control over that so I would say that as a PhD student I would say as a PhD student you don't have control over that that's what I meant to say and I would say that um, you can't pay no mind to that because even though I think it comes back to just comparing and you have to just focus on yourself compare yourself and your own journey from before maybe six months ago a year ago but there's no point in you know focusing on other people when there's nothing you can do about it, at least now. Maybe you can get your degree, become a professor, and then, you know, change things. Exactly. Another great question came in. Um, Within the system, but now I say don't pay no more to that. I am so sorry. My internet is trash, y'all. Um, can you say it again, please? I'm sorry? I was saying that my internet is trash and I didn't I didn't mean to interrupt you, I'm sorry. Oh, no, no, I'm done, so you're good. <laughs> um, another question was, uh, we have and we have two more. Which, I mean, you all can still drop some more questions in here. Any book recommendations on combating imposter syndrome? Um, so the two books that I mentioned before, even though they're not about academia, I feel like those books of just women telling their stories, especially women of color, black women, I feel like there's so much you can take away from that. So um, Elaine Waltrot's book was um, uh, more than enough and it's the it's pretty recent and there are a lot of lessons in there. There is, um, Dr. Valerie Young does have a book, just putting that out there. Um, and I believe it's called um, Thoughts of Successful Women or What Successful Women Are Really Think About. If you um, if you Google her, it'll come up. But I would say don't limit yourself to just like those self-help type books. I would say um, read other people's journey and you can get a lot from that. I like that. Um, Carla wants to know, is this your dissertation topic? I'm dissertating on this. Thank you so much for the um, presentation. There's always so much to learn with IS, imposter syndrome. Uh, no. <laughs> um, I'm actually, um, my research is around intergenerational trauma and thermal refugee youth. So it's very different. <laughs> Lenine asks, what did you learn from your biggest grad school mistake? I believe I have not made it yet because <laughs> I believe I have not made the biggest uh, mistake yet because I'm only in second year and my master's was a professional one, um, a master's of public health. So I feel like right now I'm just getting into the mindset of um, you being the, the project manager of your entire project and learning how to be independent for yourself. So I think, um, I think a piece of advice I would give is just studying yourself. So realizing what are your habits, um, what are your kind of like your pros and your cons and how to work around that, especially in grad school when everything is very independent. I like that. Uh, Ingazi asks, do you have any tips for working through perfectionism behavior to end up self-sabotaging? Mm, that's a good one. Um, I think this is something I struggle with as well. And I keep hearing that a perfect dissertation is a done dissertation, a completed one. And I have problems with that because, <laughs> because when I hear that, it just doesn't work for my professionalistic kind of personality. But 
I would think just realizing, I would say prioritizing, that is what helps. I don't think you have to limit yourself in being a perfectionist. I think you just have to make sure that, you just have to realize and acknowledge that all your tasks that you complete are not gonna be perfect. So you get to prioritize what will be more perfect than others. What are you okay with not giving your 100% in? Um, and there's gonna be things like emailing, there's gonna be things like organizing, um, and different types of things in all aspects of life. So just realizing that you cannot be 100% perfect at all the time, especially when it comes to grad school. That's real. Oh, someone just posted a book. Yes. We'll check that out. Well, y'all, um, Viveta, do you have anything else you want to share? Any insight or anything that anyone didn't ask that you want to make sure that we know about? Um, not really. I think, I think I'm good for now, but, uh, reach out to me if anything. So. Yes, please go follow her page. I mean, honestly, I don't know how you all are already because she has so mm -hmm. many amazing, like funny memes, but also really thought provoking posts, um, all the time. Um, but Vaita, thank you so much for sharing and just affirming that. Like, I feel really good. I hope y'all feel good. That was for you, especially. <laughs> just saying <laughs> No, I do. I love affirmation. I'm such a creep, but I listen to podcasts, so I'm a fan. <laughs> no, no, no. It is, it is um, bi-directional. Please believe me. Um, well, with that, you all, we're actually going to, like, give everyone a little break. Let's, yes, I see a lot of thank yous, some handcuffs. Yeah, yeah. Toronto, represent. Hi, ah, Toronto. I need to make my way out there once, you know, the world yes. is open again. Um, so a lot of thank yous, Viveta. Make sure you're following her. Y'all, the next session, um, we have nine minutes till it starts. I'm going to get some water. Um, and it's going to have a yoga session. So please, you know, if you not have time to switch into your yoga pants, I'm going to go put on my yoga pants because we're going to be talking about wellness. Um, and grab your water and get ready to talk about the physical wellness side of this graduate school journey. Um, we're going to stop now. Stop recording. Thank you.